there's one other there's one thing I need to show you that I forgot to that I printed out but forgot to photocopy which I will bring on Friday um, and that is as we move into multiple functional groups naming multiple functional groups we need rules on who gets priority and what the names are in this there is a sheet in today's folder of the priorities which as I said I was going to bring I was going to photocopy and bring I did not but might come into play with alkenes and alkynes although this is one of these IUPAC rule things that I'm I'm still trying to figure out how they came up with how they came up with the way that they actually do this in the book. I don't think the book is is following the strict or maybe they are following the strict rules. Maybe I just don't know the rules. So there is this um, priority listing of functional groups and by the end of the naming we'll work our way to the top. So um, right now we're going to be at alkenes and alkynes and <clears throat> technically Alkenes are a higher priority here than alkynes are. And in theory, the group with the higher priority always comes last in terms of the parent name. So, but for alkenes and alkynes in the book, they've done it exactly the opposite. And I'm not quite sure why. So, but but I'll bring a copy of this on Friday because as because on Friday and then next week as we finish up naming we're going to be referring to this a lot and we'll also be writing on here because there's two columns and I'll explain what that means for an exam or for homework problems that you're doing for me since there's this since there's this controversy, apparently, I'll accept either one. But when you're doing it in the book, apparently, the YNE comes last and the ENE comes before that. And that is the only exception to this chart because everything that's higher always comes last. So I, and I'm not sure why the E and the EIN, why it's an EIN EIN and not an EIN EIN. I'm not sure why they did that. I'm going to have to dig into who decided, who made these rules. The IUPAC people are just basically like, they're like the people who sit up on the mountain and decide the rules, and then they pass down the tablets, and somebody says, here are the rules. And it's like, you can't question the rules because they came up with them. So I don't know why it's an ein, why it's an ein, ein, but I'll accept either one. The book only accept one, but. Okay, questions. With multiple substituents, okay. So if we are so if we are looking at cyclic alkanes, and this is and only for cyclic alkanes. Do the, does this rule apply? Because once we start putting functional groups either in the ring or attach it to the ring, they automatically get the number one position. So this is only for alkyl groups and halogens. So for instance, if I had a BR, that group, and let's say that group. So if I said, what is the, what's the name of this cyclohexane? The first thing we have to do is we know that this is a six-membered ring, so the parent name of this is going to be cyclohexane. And what kinds of groups do we have attached to the cyclohexane? We have the BR is bromo. This group is ethyl. 
and this group up here is isopropyl. And again, I like to I like to name my groups because if I start getting into alphabetization issues, then I have the names and I already have it alphabetized, or I have the names so I can alphabetize. A um, couple things on alphabetization, though, since we're here, all one word you alphabetize on the first letter. So isopropyl is always alphabetized on I. Anything with a hyphen, like if you had a sec, if you had a sec butyl group, anything with a hyphen, always you don't you don't alphabetize the sec, the tertiary. But if something was, like I said, an isopropyl, all one word, or a cyclopropyl, then if it's all one word, it's alphabetized on the first letter. Di and tri are not alphabetized unless they're inside brackets. So we've got our three groups here. Now we need to, we need to find a numbering scheme. So the rule for a cyclohexane that only has alkyl groups and halogens is, and there'll be other functional groups that'll add to this. These are the lowest, on that chart, these are the lowest ones on the chart. They have no priority. We have to number to, we have to, number to get the numbering scheme with the lowest total sum of substituent numbers. And what that means is that I, when I have a group at one, two, and something else, I'm going to add up those numbers, so I need the lowest possible sum. Okay, so in this case, what what do you what would that lowest possible sum be? Do you think? Tell me where to start, and whether to go clockwise or counterclockwise. One, two, three. Four. That gives me a 1 plus a 2 plus a 4, so that's 7. Can you beat 7? Is that the best we have? So if I started if I started with the ethyl group it would be one, it would be one, three, and four, and that would be eight. If I started at the bromine, which sometimes people will do because they'll immediately be attracted to the bromine because it's the lowest alphabetized, rule number one is lowest sum of substituent numbers. If we have tiebreakers, we use alphabetization. But the first rule is you've got to have the lowest total sum. So that's the lowest total sum. Okay. And so we're done. We don't have any tiebreakers. So in this case, the name of this would be, now we create the alphabetized list, number in front of each group. This is a 2-bromo, 4-ethyl, 1 isopropyl cyclohexane. And again, what does that mean? That means you, if you're going to draw the name, or if you're going to draw the structure from the name, it means draw a cyclohexane ring. At carbon 1, put an isopropyl group. At carbon 4, put an ethyl group. At carbon 2, put a bromine. And I suggest, you know, as you're going through the naming, that after you get a name, cover up the structure and from your name, rewrite. Because if I gave you those kinds of problems, 99% of people get those right. The structure from the naming. Needless to say, our exam will not be drawing structures from names. It'll be the other way around. But as you're practicing, if you look at a name, like if you, if you had a name where it was like, um, one diethyl, and you're like, one diethyl, wait, where does the other ethyl group go? Then you know you've got an incorrect name. 
unless you just say, well, I'm assuming that it's 1-1 one, one diethyl, and you cannot assume with IUPAC rules. It's got to be explicit. Okay. So that would, be, that would be an example there. A tiebreaker, let's say we've got the bromine, I've got the ethyl group, and I put my isopropyl group like that. Now, how many numbering schemes do I have that will give me the lowest total sum? I'm going to have two. Do I start at bromine? No. So I could go one, two, and three, or I could go one, two, and three. And both of those give the same total number, total of substituent, total sum of substituent numbers. So now my tiebreaker is going to be based on start with the first alphabetized substituent. And so now I've got ethyl versus isopropyl. And so ethyl wins. So in this case, I'm going to start with ethyl. So this would be, again, it would be a 2-bromo, 1-ethyl, 3-isopropyl cyclohexane. But rule number one is always lowest sum of substituent numbers. And if there's a tie, that's when you use alphabetization. So you have to remember that because I can draw problems where I can easily trick you into going for the first alphabetized substituent. You've got to always go back to the basic rules and follow them one by one. That's the, that's the trickiest part of this, and that, I think, is the importance of naming. I was at a conference over the summertime, and there were Michigan people arguing with each other about apparently the big Michigan schools, and we can all figure out who those are, don't teach naming, and they're organic. And some of the smaller Michigan schools were like, but they're the big schools. They're supposed to be doing a thorough job. And it's just like, whatever. The importance about naming is that this is our first opportunity to learn how to follow rules. Because that's all organic is about, is following the rules. And why the rules are the way they are. So there's a logic to it. And you may say at the end of the semester, naming was a piece of cake, because now I have to know these reactions and mechanisms. But basically, it's just following the rules. So this is our first time to follow the rules. And the rules are much more in-depth than they were in general chemistry, which is why everybody's like, whoa, this is hard. It is, until we get into following the rules. And now, kind with both a double and a triple bond. So if we had, and you want a substituent in there too? Sure, OK. So we'll throw in a substituent. How about we throw in a bromine, and then we've got a, we'll have a CH2, then we'll have the C triple bond C, and let's put a methyl group here. Okay. And I didn't draw stereochemistry around the double bond. That's an issue we can deal with. I think we're going to hold off on EZ, although we can get into EZ. Um, this is a really early discussion of EZ and conangle prelog sequence rules. And those rules are, I mean, heads, heads are going to explode because of all the rules we're learning and then we throw those in on top of it. Um, that might, this might not be the opportune time to talk about that. We'll come to that at the end. Okay, so here it is. So now I have to remember, is this going to be, and who takes priority here? And I'm going to use that chart which says that an ene is higher on the list than an ine. So what that means is, that means the priority goes to the ene. Now I think that's the case anyway, whether we have it as an ene-ine or an ine-ene. 
But the critical part here is if I'm numbering from the end, when I now have a substituent on there, or actually a functional group in that chain, I need to decide who has priority, the triple bond or the double bond. Because I have to decide, first of all, I have to write my longest chain, or I have to identify the longest chain that contains the double and the triple bond. I only wrote one chain. Now I gotta decide where am I gonna number from? I gotta number from the end closest to the priority substitu or the priority functional group. So we're gonna treat the ene as the priority functional group. So when you have an ene versus an ene and ein, the ene is going to get priority, which means in numbering, I'm gonna number from the end closest to the double bond. And that's all I'm using in the numbering. So in this case, that's going to be left to right, right to left. I want the double bond to get the lowest number in the chain. So that's going to be left to right. So number one, number two, number three, number four, five, six, and seven. So there's only one substituent on this chain, and that's the bromo group at carbon one. So this is going to be a one bromo, and then comes the name. There is an old IUPAC system, and there is a newer IUPAC system. The old IUPAC system would have said that this would have said if this was just an alkene, it would have said that we have a two heptene. The two would have come before the hept. They, they changed that, I don't know when, they changed it to now be you put the total number of carbons in the chain first. So in other words, this is going to be a hept. And then what they decided to do was you put the number of the functional group, you put the number, then the abbreviation of the functional group, and then you make the list if necessary. And the IUPAC rules are that the one that comes last was the one with the highest priority, which they violated in this book. Or IUPAC has one special exception, which very well could be the case. But let's treat this as if the, the double bond has the highest priority. So having the highest priority means that you, you dictate the numbering. The numbering's got to be from the end closest to you, and then you come last in the list of functional groups. So in other words, now what I'm going to do is now I'm going to tell you where is the triple bond. And the triple bond is starting at carbon 5, so this would be a 5YN. Another technicality, there's no E on this, but if you put the E in, that's perfectly fine with me. I will put it in. It's kind of like a potato with the E on the end. Nobody's old enough to remember when that was a political crisis. So we have a 5 ein, and then we would have a 2 in. So... For each one of these, then, the number and then the functional group. So for alkenes, it's ene. For alkynes, it's yne. When we get to things like ketones, it'll be one. Um, alcohols, it'll be ol. So as we go through this, we'll have those lists of, of, what, um, of what the abbreviations are. And that's, those are all on the chart, and you'll be able to use the chart for exams and quizzes because that's just too much stuff to memorize. So you just need to know how to use the chart. Okay, so the book would probably say this is a 2-een, 5-ein. Fortunately, it's all multiple choice, so it's not like you're gonna see ein een versus een ein likely. But in this case, this is the name that I would draw, would be 1-bromo-hept-5-ein-2-een. Does that? 
Then the stereochemistry comes into play for the double bond. So I guess, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write it like this, since I already started to write it anyway. The easy stereochemistry for a double bond is, first of all, for a double bond, there are four things attached to the CC double bond, a maximum of four things. So there were some problems in the there are problems in in the text about label this as mono substituted, which means one alkyl group, di two, tri three, tetra four. Okay, and they use the R group for those. Which somebody asked me, what is the R group? And I first thing I said was there is no R on the periodic table, which is the first place I would look. I would look on the periodic table and say, what's R? There is no R. R is just a generic term for an alkyl group. So if I was to, for instance, say I have two alkyl groups, I have a double bond that has this kind of stereochemistry. Stereochemistry means three-dimensional structure. Remember or accept for fact, when you have a double bond, if I just had a sigma bond or a single bond, I could rotate freely. Once the double bond is in place with the pi bond, it locks it in place. So the only way I can rotate around the double bond is to break the pi bond, then rotate it and reform the double bond. At room temperature, that's not going to happen. So if you, you could have two groups like this, and I'm talking about the non-hydrogen groups, or you can have two groups like this in terms of where, how they're located within the double bond. So we'd have two groups either opposite each other or two groups that are next to each other. Now, when you have one non-hydrogen group and one hydrogen group attached to each of the two carbons, so one non-hydrogen, one hydrogen, attached to each of the two carbons, that sets up two distinct three-dimensional structures, what are called stereoisomers. So in this case, when they are opposite each other, that is what is called trans. And when they are next to each other on the double bond, that is what is called cis. And you can only use cis or trans if you have one non-hydrogen group and one hydrogen group attached to each of the carbons. And the reasoning for that is that if trans is opposite and cis is on the same side, if I gave you this molecule and said, what is it? You, you could be looking at the R group, another person could be looking at the H groups, and they would label it the same. Because they would say, oh, it's cis because the two hydrogens are on the same side. Or it's cis because the two alkyl groups are on the same side. And so if you have one non-hydrogen one hydrogen group on each of the two carbons, we label the stereochemistry with cis and trans. What if you have like one R group and one lower priority R group? Well, that gets us into the EZ, which is not. Mm -hmm. And so there we have to talk about what are called the conangle prelog sequence rules in order to decide, design or decide high and low priorities. And at this point, let's hold off on the easy stuff for the moment because that's a whole series of rules and let's get through naming alkenes and alkynes first and then we can throw in easy so right now it's just cis or trans so what that means is this if you have like one R group two R groups and a third R group so in other words in the double bond you have four things the minute you have three non-hydrogen groups attached, you have to go to the EZ system. 
And there is no cis or trans in the EZ system. Cis and trans are replaced by mm -hmm. E and Z. So this has to be named under the EZ system. Okay. So we're going to hold off on that for the moment, which means any of those problems you can hold off on for the moment. If you did them, great. If not, hold off on them. So how do you work um, like this into the name up above? So that's the next thing. So is everybody okay with cis and trans? One thing I will say is this. If you have the same group attached, let's say I've got, and I'll, I'll replace the R with a specific group. Let's say I have two methyl groups attached to the same carbon. If you have two groups that are identically the same attached to one of the carbons, there is no more cis or trans, and there is no easy. In other words, Having this methyl group here is the same stereochemistry as moving this methyl group down here. Because you would say, oh, this methyl group is cis to that methyl group and it's trans to that methyl group. And then if I move the methyl group down here, you would say, oh, it's cis to a methyl and trans to another methyl. Same three-dimensional structure. So this example where these two groups are the same, that is not cis trans or E or Z. There is only one stereochemistry for that double bond. So that's one of the things you have to check for as well. And I think there's some problems in there where they've given you like three of them and they've said which one of these is not cis or trans or E or Z. And it turns out to be one that has two hydrogens attached to the same carbon. So anytime the same group is attached to one carbon, you can't have cis trans, you can't have easy. Okay. So where does it go in the name then? It just goes at the beginning. So in other words, for this one, for the molecule I wrote up here, what is it, cis or trans? It's cis. So it would just be cis one bromo have the five I, three E, or two E. And triple bonds don't have the ability to have stereochemistry because they're linear. So a lot of these naming rules are just, they're just little differences in the overall scheme of things. The overall scheme of things is we need to find the longest chain if it's not cyclic. The next thing is numbering. What end do we number from? And because a ring has no end, we had to come, they had to come up with a whole set of rules that if people followed, you'd get one name and one name only. That's why the lowest total sum of substituent numbers started, is that rule. Then when you have multiple functional groups in the molecule, you need to, you need to number, first of all, you need to have the chain have the, all those functional groups. And then you need to number from the end closest to the, to the functional group that has the highest priority. And for some reason, there's this inconsistency in eins and eens. Otherwise, it's that chart, and whatever's on top gets the priority in numbering, but it gets the last name. Because this is going to be this is going to be the one with the highest priority from that sheet of functional groups. Okay, with that, what else? Of having to use bicyclo, the numbering scheme, the 
like okay naming one, naming one. okay mm. let's see Let's say we have that as our core structure. Let me put a bromine there. And an ethyl there. So I think at the end of class we did one with just a single. And did we, did we do one last time? with a substituent. I know we kind of, I kind of hit with two classes. It's hard for me to sometimes remember what I did in one versus what I did in the other. So if I said, remember, we did this last time and we didn't, then just say that was the other class. OK. So what is the, I'll give you a moment, what is the parent name of this molecule what's the parent what's the parent name going to be Do we have a name? What do you got? Your choice. Give me the total number of carbons, or you can give me the what goes in the brackets. Octane, Octane for the total number. Do we agree? So let's say bicyclo dot 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 octane. What are the dots? A three, a two, and a one. Do we agree? Actually, the the rules are you just go from highest to lowest. So, and and three one two would be the same as three two one. But the rule is you're supposed to go from biggest number to smallest number. If you did that, I probably would give you credit. If you said 312, I would give you credit for it. Because the thing is, if you're trying to, like, if you're working from left to right, remember, I can take this molecule, I can spin it, so then the numbers would be all jumbled up. All these, all these naming rules are... All these naming rules were developed at a time before computers. Before computer searching became the norm. So like when I was in college, a long time ago, in the mid to late eight or the mid to the early to mid eighties, we didn't have computers with the internet. 
that we could like search the name of molecules or better yet if we had a molecule and we needed to know its physical properties like what you do in lab we didn't have the ability to go to the computer and type on the internet and have it like that I know I walked and then we walked to class in snow both ways no shoes etc but we had books and somehow people had to come up with a way that you could organize the names in an alphabetical manner so that you could go through the books and you could find that name. And so when it says it's 321, it's because in the book you would go, you would see like 432, and then you'd keep going until you found 321 versus 320 versus 310. So that's the sort of historical context of all these naming, is that they developed it for an index in the books long before computer searching started. But I digress. So 3, 2, 1, I'm looking at 1, 2, 3 there. I'm looking at 1, 2 here. And I'm looking at 1 there. So that's that would be the 3, 2, 1. Okay, so everybody okay with that parent name? Now, uh, alphabet, or now substituents. So we're going to try and get the numbering scheme to give us the first alphabetized substituent. If we have one substituent, we're working towards getting that substituent the lowest possible number. If we have two, we're looking at, first of all, getting the first alphabetized substituent the lowest number. And then either the other one will fall into place, or if we have a choice, we get the second one the, its lowest number. So we take them sequentially. So in this case, I want the bromine to have the lowest number. But remember my rules. What's rule number one? You must start at bridgehead. So we got to start at either bridgehead A or B. Then what's rule number two? We've got to go through the longest propeller, the second longest propeller, and then we pick up and we go to the third. So we have to do that. So, I'll give you a minute. So we can start at A or B, and we've got to go through the longest, and then the second longest. How would you know, how would you come up with a numbering scheme to give you bromine, to give bromine the lowest number? Okay. I'll give you a minute to take a look at that, and you can discuss with neighbors, debate, argue. I don't, I don't, I might, I might, well, but we can do that, we can do that after we get this. It's that, drawing it from the name is easier than getting the name from the structure. Okay, do we have a number for bromine? Right, give me a number for, what number would go on the bromine? Okay, on the three. I'll go one, two, won't say the three, you give me, you shout out your number. One, two, six. What was the dominant number I heard? Did I hear any other numbers? Six or seven. 
Any other numbers? If, uh, if that was an eight, no, eight's not happening. Okay, so, so six would be the lowest number, but how do we get there? If we can get there. So if we want six, what should I start with? A or B? A. A. So number one, then I've got to go two, three, four, and then five, and now up to six and seven. So we have to go start at the bridgehead, go through the propeller to get to the other bridgehead, then up through the middle propeller, and then we have to pick up our pencil and move to the third propeller. So we move it, we go all in one fell swoop. So in this case, starting with A, you would get a six. I'll change here, or let's see. So if I go the other way, just so we know where the seven would come from, if I started with B and I went one, why isn't it a red? One, two, three, four, five, six, and then that would give me the seven if I started with B and went back around. And again, like I think I ended class with on Monday, if you have propellers that have the same length, then you're going to choose whatever numbering scheme, whichever one is going to give you the lowest number. So you're not obligated. If you had a two and a two, you could use either two first to get the lowest number. But if you have three different sized propellers, the rule is you've got to go longest, middle, short. So the red numbering scheme doesn't give me the lowest number, but I'll leave it there. So we've got a six bromo, and then what's left over for the ethyl? Eight, ha eight the ethyl has to be eight because it's on the shortest propeller. So the IUPAC people came up with this system so that everybody would give the Bromo the same number if you follow the rules. And that there's no multiple possible numbers. So you so if one substituent, give it the lowest number following those rules. If you've got two, take, the, take on the first one that's alphabetized, and then take on the next one. Does that make sense? What else? Sure. So uh, you want bicyclic? Okay. So let's say I said, first of all, draw, first of all, draw a parent, the parent name. If I said, let's have a bicyclo four, two, one. Not a non-ane. So, what would the what would the bicyclic structure be? How would you draw that out for a bicyclo four two one non-ane? Sure, there's multiple ways, but here's the critical part. I just have to get the right propellers. So whether the propellers are like the longest ones this way and the shortest ones this way or the longest ones this way and the shortest ones this way, that's just rotating around the molecule. Yeah, there's a, there's a billion different ways you can draw this, but if I'm going to grade it, I'm just going to make sure that you've got the right length propellers. 
So how would we draw this? Do we need help? All right, we need help. Somebody help. What, how should I start? I got a, I got a better idea. Let's start with the two bridge heads. So you want to you want to have like seven going across here. So we got one, two, let's see, one, two, three, four that way. No. And then one, two that way. And then one like that. So one of the ways we can do that is to draw the two bridge heads and then off of each bridge head put the number of carbons that's in the propeller. So this is a so here's my four carbons, here's my two carbons, and then here's my one carbon. Now whether you have this incomplete triangle, let's call it, up, left, right, doesn't matter. You have to have one, one propeller, and one two propeller, and one four propeller. So then if we had a substituent on there, we would have to First of all, I, first of all, I'm tempting fate if I try and make up a substituent number because without having one of these in my head, I'm going to get the number wrong, and then everybody's going to be confused. But just writing the just writing the core structure, I would start with the two bridge heads, and then draw each of the three three um, propellers from that. And then, whatever the substituent number is, we go back and follow those rules. Okay. All right, if you have um, other questions, you know, post them to Piazza. I don't know how many questions I'm answering, but I'm trying to get to them by the end of the day. So if you check back, you'll see different things. I'm trying to keep the videos to a bare minimum. But if you have any questions, either ask me or submit them there. Friday, we can pick up on alkenes and alkynes, but please read for the next section of the textbook, the next functional groups for Friday. Okay?